Lahwan, her life, her challenges, her struggle, her wisdom, and her marriage to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, her uh, marriage prior to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with uh, Abu Salama, inshallah, all of that we will be talking about today and then continuing into next week as well. So once again, let's get started with uh, the life of Zainab bint Khuzayma, radiallahu anha, the little that we know about her. Um, we do know very little about her and uh, the reason is that she, her, the marriage with Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Zainab bint Khuzayma was very short-lived. She died some say uh, three months after the marriage, some say seven months after the marriage, somewhere around the fourth year of Hijrah. So that's the reason we don't have many narrations from her or about her. Uh, but uh, the little that we know about her, SubhanAllah, she is known or she was known even for her generosity and her kindness and compassion towards the poor even before Islam. So the, the, the society, the community at the time gave her the kunya Ummul Masakin, the mother of the needy. So she would make sure that she's always giving, sharing with the needy in the community. So Zainab bin Khuzayma, obviously her father's name was Khuzayma. And then her mother's name was um, Hind bint Auf. She is known to be one of the most noble mother-in-laws in the history of Sira. How so? Well, uh, Hind bint uh, Auf, she had six daughters not uh, from different marriages right and the oldest was Zainab bint Khuzayma so Zainab bint Khuzayma what makes Hind honorable mother-in-law right so Zainab bint Khuzayma she was married to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so Hind is the mother-in-law to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Zainab not just through Zainab she is actually also the mother-in-law to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through another daughter of hers who is the half sister of Zainab bint Khuzayma and we will be studying about her life her name is Maymuna bint al Haris. so in the wives of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the only two who were not from the tribe of Quraysh they were actually from the tribe of Hawazin so Zainab bint Khuzayma Maymuna bint al Haris, the half sister of Zainab bint Khuzayma they were both from the tribe of Hawazin, right? And it was after the death, of course, after the death of Zainab bint Khuzayma that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets married to Maymuna bint al Haris. So there you go. Uh, Hind bint Auf, the mother of Zainab, she was the mother in law to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through uh, two daughters, right? And the, uh, uh, the other daughters that he had, that she had, one of them was Asma bin Tumais. Of course, she's very famous. She is the wife of Jafar ibn Abi Talib, right? So after the death of Jafar ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Mu'ta, uh, she gets married, Asma bin Tumais, she gets married to Abu Bakr. And after the death of Abu Bakr, she gets married to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So she is the mother in law to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to Ali radiallahu an, to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Of course, who else can be more honorable of a mother in law than Hind bint Auf? So that was a little side note on uh, the mother of Zainab bint Khuzayma. And like we said, Zainab bint Khuzayma, she uh, was a very short lived marriage marriage with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She got married to him in the third year of Hijra, some say like few days after the marriage to Hafsa radiallahu anha, Rasul's marriage to Hafsa radiallahu anha. The circumstances in which Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets married to her. She becomes a widow. Uh, to uh, she, she's a widow of uh, the most one of the most prominent Sahabas in uh, Sira. His name is Obeida ibn al Haris, right? Who is Obeida ibn al Haris? Obeida ibn al Haris. If you have gone through Sira and if you have studied the Battle of Badr, you know what Mubaraza means. Mubaraza is what? It's the opening duel, right? So it was the it was a customary practice at that time that before the actual fight happened. Uh, a few from the opponents and few for a few from the opponents and few from the Muslim army they would one on one fight one another right so from the Muslim army we had Hamza radiallahu an we had uh, Ali radiallahu an and we had Ubaidah radiallahu anha who was Zainab bint Khuzayma's husband right so Ubaidah radiallahu an he was opposing who was his opponent Utbah right um he, 
Hamza radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an were able to take out and overcome their opponents very easily. Ubaidah radiallahu an was able to do so also, but Utbah was able to chop off or cut off, right? Cut off um, Ubaidah radiallahu an's leg. And that injury eventually leads to, he does not die at the time, right? But eventually that is the injury that leads to his death and he becomes a martyr uh, from the battle of Badr, Ubaidah radiallahu anh, and that's how Zainab bint Khuzayma, she uh, becomes a widow. As soon as her idda is over, that's when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proposes marriage to her. Again, just think about the stigma that is attached to the remarrying uh, of, uh, of uh, widows or, you know, how people, when they suit, when they, when they seek uh, proposals, if they come across uh, ladies who have been widowed, the the, 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 the mindset with which they approach that family, how culture, how culture has become so different, right? We see all these great men, including Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they, when, when you look at their lives and their marriages, I mean, it, it was it was nothing it was it was normal for that time like we saw the case of asma bint umais the sister of zainab bint uh, 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 zainab bint huzaima right uh, she half sister she got married to uh, uh, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, when he passed away, she became his widow. Then what? Abu Bakr radiallahu anh got married. She became a widow again. And then who got married? Ali radiallahu anh got married. So this this uh, stigma that is attached, hopefully, hopefully, inshallah, we will become enlightened. This kind of education will open our minds and we will look at these situations in a different light. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us that tawfiq. Um, so that is the end or that is all that we know about the life of Zainab bint Khuzayma radiallahu an, our mother and the mother of the Masakin. Uh, she is, uh, oh, I cannot, how can I forget this? One of the greatest blessings of uh, Zainab bint Khuzayma, even though we don't know much about her, right? One of the greatest blessings of Zainab bint Khuzayma, which is unique to her, right, is the fact that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after her death, he prayed Salatul Janazah for her, right? He led the, he led her Salatul Janazah. How is this unique? Number one, the only other wife who died in the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Khadija radiallahu anha, right? And she is buried in Mecca. And at that time, we didn't have Salatul Janazah, right? So she was the first and the only wife of uh, whose, whose Salatul Janazah, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself led and she was the first one to be buried amongst his wives in Jannatul Baqir. So this is the blessing that is unique to Zainab bint Khuzayma radiallahu anha, our mother. Now moving on to our next mother and that is Um Salama radiallahu anha. And like I said, when we talk about Um Salama radiallahu and there's so much to talk about, but particularly what we are going to highlight uh, today is in addition to her biographical details, we are going to be talking about those those heart-wrenching experiences that she went through before her marriage to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam that can easily be described as one of the most difficult challenges that any mother, any parent has to ever go through, any spouse has to ever go through. Her relationship with Abu Salama, it was well known, widely known that they were a much a happy couple, happily married, they were deeply in love with one another. And then this episode happens in their life where the three of them are separated and Um Salama, she's separated from her infant child, right? She's separated from her beloved husband, doesn't know when they will reunite again. So inshallah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, who is Um Salama radiallahu anha? Um Salama radiallahu anha, that's her kunya. Her real name is Hind bint Abi Umayya and she is from the tribe of Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum rings a bell. It's one of the most prominent tribes amongst the Quraysh one tribe that was constantly in competition with Banu Hashim. Name few prominent figures from the tribe of Banu Makhzum. Abu Jahl, who was her uncle, Khalid bin Walid, uh, that is um, her cousin, right? And then... Um, you have uh, so so you have these prominent figures. Uh, Walid bin Mughira is also, who's her uncle. He's also from the tribe of uh, Banu Makhzum. Um, 
Banu Makhzum was known, the tribe was known for their level of education. They were known for their um, horsemanship. They were known for their wealth, right? So Um Salama radiallahu an, she came from a family of wealth. She was well respected in the community. She was educated, all right, which was very rare back in those days. Even men were not as educated. And for a woman to be educated at that time, to know how to read and write was extremely rare. So she was literate right and um, she was extremely beautiful as well so um salama radiallahu an her father's name is uh, umayya ibn mughira ibn al mughira who has the nickname of zadur riqab right what does that mean? So if you, if anyone had a caravan and it, they were, they were going to Syria or they were going to Yemen, they had to just join the caravan of uh, Umayyah, the father of uh, Um Salama radiallahu an, and he would basically take care of their food and their water and everything, like all the provisions he would take care of. So the one who took care of the provisions and that's why he got that um, nickname Zadur Riqab, the one who provided or uh, supplied provisions for the travelers right so he was known for his generosity and kindness and compassion and again he was very wealthy of course uh, that is established from Um Salama's Um Salama being a wealthy woman herself her mother we don't know much about her her mother's name is Atika the only fact that we know about her is that she is the aunt of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she had very many siblings right Um Salama radiallahu an but there is one um, one sibling whose story is very interesting and I'd like to share that uh, story with you. Uh, the, the story is about her sibling Amir ibn, al, uh, uh, Amir ibn Abi Umayya and um, he became a Muslim at the time of Fatah Makkah in the eighth year of Hijra, right? The eighth year of Hijra, that's when he accepts Islam. Until then, he's one of the staunchest enemies of Islam. Not only that, if you go back to Sira in uh, early, in, in the tenth year of uh, uh, Meccan life of uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you recall the scene where Abu Talib uh, is breathing his last, what do you see there, right? In that, in that image, who do you see there? You see Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on one side of Abu Talib constantly begging him to ex to accept Islam, to accept faith, and then he would he 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 would take the case with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala about him with Allah take his case to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right? He just wanted him to accept faith. He wanted him to die on faith. So as Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was begging and imploring Abu Talib, on the other side, right, there were these two people who were constantly prompting Abu Talib, like saying, "Oh." Are you going to give up the ways of your forefathers? This is what they meant to you? This is what their ways have meant to you? That you're just going to give it up? Who are those two? That was Abu Jahl. And the other person was the brother of Um Salama radiallahu anha and his name Amr ibn Abi Umayyah. Right? SubhanAllah, think about it. He is the person, right, who insisted on the kufr of Abu Talib. Right, while Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam was trying to was trying to get him to iman to accept iman, he is one of those two people who was insisting, who was constantly prompting Abu Talib not to accept, and then he himself accepts Islam at the eight in during uh, during Mecca in the eighth year of Hijra. Right. In the hands of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he dies as a Sahabi in Jannatul Baqiyah. Allah has his ways of working through people. Allah has his ways of bringing change to people. All we can take from this story is that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone who brings about change of hearts, right? Muqallib al-qulub, musarrif al-qulub. He is the one. He is the only one who has that complete authority. Through the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one important lesson that we take when we are trying to communicate this beautiful message, we have to to keep in mind that we communicate to convey we don't communicate to confront right so it's always to convey the message and then it is basically the pe the person's choice whether they accept it or whether they did not accept it right so that's the interesting story about the brother of um salama radiallahu an and now of course we move on to the story about her and her husband before the marriage to rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam um salama radiallahu anha she was married to abu salama radiallahu an 
both of them are early converts right they accepted islam they're, they're the first batch the when only like maybe 10 11 people had accepted islam they belong to that batch of muslims right so think about it like uh um salama radiallahu and the comfortable life that she had the wealth that she had she gave that all up right she gave everything up why to accept islam to uh to to, to submit to the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only that they are also the couple is also the first of the couples to migrate to abyssinia we know persecution became intense and every day it was only getting worse when Quraysh they saw that they could not contain the momentum of islam they did everything possible right they did everything possible to attack the muslims they were hounding the muslims they were physically abusing them they were verbally abusing them to the point where Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to give them the permission to migrate to Abyssinia. So they are Abu Salama and Um Salama are one of the first couples. Um, um Salama, she was the first of the four women and Abu Salama, he was the first of the ten men to migrate to Abyssinia. When they migrate to Abyssinia, that's where they have baby Salama. So baby Salama, you can say, is the first baby to be born, okay, to a Muslim couple in Abyssinia, all right? So that way, it's a, he's a special baby. So they, that's, that's how both of them get their uh, names, the nicknames, Abu Salama and Um Salama. Now, we know in between, we hear this story where, you know, um, that, that the entire Makkah had accepted Islam. We are familiar with those, with, when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he recited the verses of Surah Najm and all of that, right? It was a rumor but we know based on that rumor many people from Abyssinia they returned back so Um Salama and Abu Salama radiallahu and both of them also came back and they decided to stay back in Mecca they, 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 they didn't go back many returned back but they decided to stay back in Mecca they wanted to stay near to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they wanted to stay close to the source of uh, revelation right Wahi. so they decide to stay back until it is time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the command or gives the permission to migrate to Medina and now one by one sahabas are also migrating and this is where we have that most painful experience that Um Salama radiallahu anha goes through while migrating from Mecca to Medina what happens so um, her husband Abu Salama he prepares the camel right and he gets her and um, Abu Salama who's basically like a year old not even a year old infant baby right he's he's a lap baby so he's gonna be with her he get not gets both of them on the camel and then he starts to walk the camel right they're barely able to exit Mecca they're barely able to step outside of Mecca that the family of Um Salama radiallahu anh, comes there right they arrive there and they're like you know what you can do they're talking to Abu Salama and they're saying you can do whatever you want to do you want to go to Medina go to Medina but you are not taking our daughter anywhere right so they pin him down to the ground and they forcefully uh, get Um Salama down the camel with the baby the baby's of course with her so th they're dragging her away right and uh, he is he's just left on the ground here as they are taking her away right with the baby the family of abu salama which is the tribe of banu asad right they also arrive there and they see this happening and they're like hey you are not going anywhere with our son who are they referring to they're now referring to baby salama right because uh, abu salama is an adult he can do whatever right so they're like we don't have control over him but you are not going anywhere with our son yani baby salama so then uh hustle starts between the two tribes right and um salama is trying to hold on to her baby but of course she's overwhelmed she's overcome and then eventually the tribe her tribe is only walks away just with her right banu asad walks away with the baby and abu salama is left on the ground eventually he gathers himself and then he heads to medina this beautiful family of three right husband wife and their little child separated Um Salama with her family the baby with the grandparents right father's family and he is on his way to Medina not now none of them know both the father and the mother Um Salama Abu Salama they don't know when they are going to be reunited and in the story of Um Salama herself subhanallah you just get to see her tawakkul the lesson that we take you see the tawakkul of Um Salama through and through in this incident right through this incident she narrates it herself so she has been separated from her child imagine like if you 
as, as a mother, if I don't hear from my child, half a day has passed by, and if I don't hear, I know he's out somewhere, and if I don't hear from him, after, like maybe after two hours or three hours of trying him, I panic, I, you know, and everybody can relate to this, right? Think about it. She has been separated from her child. She has been separated from her spouse, and now she does not know when they're going to be reuni reunited, if they're going to be reunited. So she herself says, like every day, and we don't know the duration exactly. Some reports mentioned that it was about a year, right, of separation. And some reports mentions, mentioned it was shorter than that. Whatever, there was a separation and it was a period of separation, right? Even one day, even one hour, not knowing what's happening with your spouse, not knowing what's happening with your child. I mean, who can take that, right? So she describes herself, she's like, every day I used to go to the valley where this tragedy happened. She would sit there, right? For as long as possible, she would sit there and she would cry. That's ba that, that basically became her daily routine. Just imagine. Can you imagine at that time, at that time, what kept her in faith? What gave her the strength to remain in faith, to still remain steadfast? She had lost basically everything. If you look at it in the dunyawi sense, right? Everything has been taken away from her. And if you say the reason was what? The reason was la ilaha illallah. But then she held on. She not only held on, but she held on tough. It's not that she was not anxious. It's not that she did not have the fear of the unknown. I mean that she's a human being at the end of the day, right? But what is it that allowed her, despite the feelings that she may have experienced as a human being, as a mother, what is it that allowed her to set the course right? One word, tawakkul. That tawakkul, her tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is what helped her to remain optimistic in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It is that tawakkul that constantly reminded her, despite the waswasa of shaitan, like why is this happening to me, right? Despite the waswasa of shaitan, it was her tawakkul that constantly kept telling her, this shall soon pass, right? Or, you, you, you know, to have that ability to just hand over your burden and your worries to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind yourself that perhaps you dislike something but it is good for you and perhaps you like something that that is but that is uh, 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 bad for you you know to rem it's it's not an easy thing to do your heart requires so much capacity right but at the end of the day, these are the lessons that we take. It, it just goes to show her strength, right? Whenever she was united, reunited with her son, she didn't know that was that was going to happen. She didn't know when it was going to happen and she didn't know if it was ever going to happen. So while she was experiencing this, right, this pain of separation, firmly um, anchoring her hopes upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his troops. And who was the troop? What did this troop look like? One of her cousins, maybe a member of her family, extended family member. We don't know the details of that person. We only know that he was someone from the family who noticed her crying every day and it melted his heart. He he was he was feeling her pain, and that's when he took it up, he took up the matter with her family and asked them, Why are you doing this? Why are you separating her from her child and her husband? And then finally the family also uh, sees sees her pain, feels her pain, and decides to free her. But at that time, so when they free her now. Um Salama is ready to go to Medina, right? But she cannot go to Medina without her child. So at that time she says like, you know, I cannot go without my child. So then the same family members, her own family members who separated her from her son, they go to the uh, family of uh, Abu Salama, Banu Asad, the tribe of Banu Asad. They have a conversation with them, they convince them. And then finally, finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works, right? He works in miraculous ways. The same tribe then hand over the baby to Um Salama and now Um Salama has her baby. She is, she, you see her on a camel and she's ready to cross the desert, a 10 day journey by herself, a woman where there's no green, where there's no water, right? She is going to cross the desert how? Just with her tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, next week we will see what happens in her journey as she crosses the desert, who she meets, how she arrives in Medina, and then eventually her marriage to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, next week, same time, same place. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Qad aflaha al-mu'minun.
الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين 